Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, the 13th of May. Mercury is in retrograde. Zoom was funky today, at least in New York. Not where my guest is in Kentucky and not for my wonderful engineer, Johan, in Berlin. I'm Fred Plotkin, so this must be Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. My guest today, it's one of those situations for people who follow my program know this, that we have never met, but we know each other. We have communicated for years via social media, via email. We've never even spoken on the phone, but we've gone into many, many topics. And I know of his work, and I know his work is greatly admired. And I know that he is greatly admired. So what's his name? Dean Williamson, Maestro Dean Williamson, an American conductor who grew up in part in the Far East, Far East is a terminology that maybe we shouldn't use anymore. Dean, what do you think? It's it's problematic. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> How about East Asia? Does that's that problematic too, because a lot of people in um, Southeast Asia, East, and actually that's a good one because we're starting to split. Um, uh, I'm actually part Chinese, I'm Eurasian. My, my mom was from Shanghai, I was born in Taiwan. Uh, my dad was from Ohio, uh, German Scottish, and uh, uh, they, he was in the CIA military. And then uh, she had escaped China and was living in Hong Kong. And they met when she was a flight attendant for Cathay Pacific. And uh, he was a pilot for the Air America. Those who know the covert American activities uh, know what that is during the Vietnam War. And so I grew up over there, you know. So as an expat, um, you know, tall, kind of came out blonde hair. Toe had blonde when I was a kid and my sister too. So didn't come to the States till I was about 16 for the first time, which is like going to a foreign country. Um, so you're like but, a little bit like the child in Madama Butterfly who's blonde yeah. and has blue eyes <laughs> and yet has an Asian mother. Yeah, yeah, because my grand, let's see, my, if I get this right, her grandfather, so my grandfather's father came over from Scotland. Her, my mother's Eng, uh, British name is Bentley. And so he came over, he had curly blonde hair, blue eyes, married a Chinese woman. Their son was my grandfather. And then my mother's, my grandmother is half Chinese, half Filipino. So my mom is an interesting mix there. And so I guess because my mom had the blonde gene in her, so my dad was blonde hair, blue eyed, couldn't tell when he went gray. Um, so my sister and I came out to head blondes and my mom used to always say, you know, the other military wives thought she was the nanny because she's pushing, <laughs> she looks very Chinese and she's pushing her, you know, her two little blonde kids. <laughs> so that she don't ask this of people, but I will ask it of you. Have you done one of these DNA searches? I did. And does it come out to be a very unusual mix? Many people, myself included, <laughs> are largely one thing. And then I have a dash of German to my great surprise. Mm -hmm. But there we are. Yeah. Did yours come out to be like 10% this, 10% that? I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a real mutt, real mongrel. And so I did the Ancestry one. And what I like about it is that the regular updates come and they keep refining it. So uh, the, the shift keeps adjusting slightly. And I, I am technically, according to them, I think 35, 40% Asian mix and everything from uh, because probably the Filipino, the Southeast Asian with the um, North Asian. At one point they said I was like 3% Korean. So all my, you know, Korean singer friends were thrilled. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love Korean food. So, um, but I think that's now minimized with the latest reduction, with the latest re, uh, release of the, the genome, my genome. So um, who knows, but you know, it, it's, uh, I can spot a Eurasian across the room, across the street. Um, uh, because all my all my friends that I grew up with in the Far East were we were children of uh, black, white, Hispanic, um, American servicemen married to Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese women, and so that was normal for me, you know. And so it was difficult when we came to the states, uh, and, and we ended up we tried LA for summer because we had relatives there on both sides of the family. Didn't like it. And my dad was in the Navy flight training in Midby Island in Seattle, so he said, "Let's just go up there. It's it's a lot prettier." So. We went up there and it was like, I got dropped into a very white 1800 
a person suburban high school where all of a sudden everybody, if you think about it, it's weird. Everybody, I'm used to growing up being tall and blonde in Japan, for example. Um, and all of a sudden I'm planted in a place where everybody looks and speaks and talks like me, uh, which is kind of this reverse um, identity crisis thing. And, and they've actually done studies now of expat kids. So children of expats who grew up in multiple countries and societies. And when they go back to their home country, they feel like a foreigner. And it's a big period of adjustment. A lot of the older siblings of uh, my friends who went finished high school, let's say in Japan or in Thailand, kid would come back to the States for college. Many of them could never adjust. They would finish school, college, and then they would go overseas and live permanently overseas, find a job in a company overseas in Europe or in Asia or whatever, and become ex live that expat life. And there's a huge expat life of Americans as well as you know Brits and uh, Germans and Italians um, and especially like in Seattle I see that with all of the people that come to work for Microsoft from around the world mm -hmm. and now they're dealing with that with their kids being raised in Seattle as uh, that American classic American West Coast lifestyle um, and it's difficult for them if their parents do a good job they stay connected to their home culture for example the italian community in uh, seattle now there are a bunch of italians that have come over to work for microsoft and amazon um, and, and google and so they have formed italian cultural groups to kind of so they can at least meet and speak and maintain some connection and have that connection for their children um, it's difficult because we have a lot of italophiles in seattle and so they tried, the, the two don't seem to mix very well because they have different goals. The Italians just want to get together and speak and, and be around Italian and not have to study Italian culture. But the Italophiles want to you know, have the lectures and Dante and, and Italian culture and the literature and music and all of that. So there are two separate paths, two separate groups that I'm, I'm seeing grow up. And um, but so it's very interesting to see how each community is kind of trying to maintain ties to their home and so that's something I never had because you know as military government service CIA kid we moved every two three four years all around mm -hmm. so I lived in Japan Okinawa Taiwan Thailand uh, Laos I was in Vientiane Laos when that fell and we were shipped across the Mekong River to um, northern Thailand where it's so dangerous to go to Air Force Base that even the American servicemen had to, the families had to be in Bangkok and the servicemen couldn't be there, but the CIA says, oh, please bring your kids. And, you know, I went to the America, Air America High School, five seniors graduated. I remember playing pomp and circumstance. I was in ninth grade then, eight people in my class. You know, so it was a, you know, little house on the prairie in the rice paddies in northern, <laughs> northern Thailand. Paddies. So um, since you mentioned Seattle and tall blonde guys in Italy, I'm going to mention something. And then I have a question for you that may sound personal but you don't have to give personal details but you'll understand the question mm -hmm. um many people in america and elsewhere know someone named rick steves who is a tall mm -hmm. blonde seattle oh, yeah. guy whose father was a piano tuner and mm -hmm. came to music rick came to music naturally he is america's leading travel writer yes. and he and i have just collaborated on a book that comes out in january 2023 called The Rick Steves Guide to Eating in Italy by Rick Steves and Fred Plotkin. And I know that you have an Italian part of your life as a home in Italy, so we can talk about that later. But um, it's interesting because Rick is part of that community of Italophiles in Seattle, and he's spoken to me about how that community differs from the Italians abroad who are yeah. trying, they connect to the Italian TV and they watch the soccer matches, the football matches, and they have a different experience than the Italo files. Um, now, here's the question, and it's about me as well as you and, and a number of people. As teenage boys, and it applies to teenage girls too, um, and as young adults, not only in terms of education, school training, but in terms of socialization and where we have important first experiences and where we learn how to interact with our, our colleagues and our, our, if the Italians say coetani, people of our same age. Um, although I was born in New York, I left here when I was 16 and lived away for a long time, much of it in Italy. And therefore, 
my acculturation, my socialization, my learning how to deal with people, my learning friendship skills and so on really happened in Italy. And what that means is I don't regret that at all. But what that means is, is that in New York, in the United States, I sometimes don't quite mesh because the social cues and the behavioral cues and the everything that comes with that, the going out for a drink, for example, um, is something I am not practiced in. And my interactions, I interact still better, I think, with Italians because the social cues are natural. If you grow up in parts of Asia and frankly kept moving around a lot, how old were you when you got to the United States? And to what degree are your social skills, your acculturation, your your reading of cues formed more in Asia and formed in the United States? I, I would say I'm more of a product of Asia, um, of the Chinese, specifically the Chinese, Japanese, but there's a lot of similarity there as well as differences, but that, that the cues are more subtle or more inward, more, um, for example, Chinese is a, Mandarin is a very difficult language and they say doing business with the Chinese is difficult because for example, in Mandarin, um, there is no real past tense. You throw the language in the past with an article at the end, le, um, there's no conjugation of verbs. Uh, it's a gender less neutral language. Mm -hmm. So trying to do business, you have to, you're talking by inference. And so, um, there has to be a lot of reading between the lines. There's a lot of, of understanding uh, that if I do this, if I do you a favor, then I expect that you will do me a favor. It's let's do a handshake kind of thing. Um, and whereas in the West, in America, it's much more cut and dry. It's much more in your face. And it's much more, I'm going to tell you what I think and what I expect of you out of this negotiation or whatever. Um, and that, I and so that was difficult for me. The other thing too, being, they've done studies about this, being uh, an expat kid and traveling all the time, especially military kids, it's harder for us to plant roots in a place uh, because we don't have any growing up. But the, the alternate side, the good side of the coin is that we make friends very easily. We are comfortable. You can pick me up and move me into another city and I don't freak out. And I think it's helped me in my career when I have to, like this trip I'm on now is literally a six month trip by the time I've left Seattle and I'll get back in October. Uh, four or five operas, a trip to Italy and back and I'm driving all around and flying all around. And doesn't phase me. In fact, it excites me. And I said, you know, I have my packing list and my spreadsheets and I have everything all organized and every day is an adventure. But other friends of mine would look at that and be horrified. Like, how could you do that? You're leaving your house. I'm like, well, you know, it's something I'm used to. I've been doing this for so long. Um, and I see it in my other expat friends is that we, we, you can drop us into a cocktail party. I can survive if I don't know anybody. I may not be super happy, but I, I can quickly figure out the lay of the land. Um, so it is a different set of social, you're right. It's, it's, I've never thought about that, but you're right. It's a different set of social cues. And, and then coming to the States where people were much more direct and much more, um, it was almost because that directness was almost more confusing for me. And I have to tell you that my three years in high school were probably the worst times in my yeah. life. And I hated it. And I did <laughs> not even want to, I, I thought as soon as I graduate, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go back to Japan or go to Europe or something. I don't know. And, um, and I got to college at University of Washington my first year. And I was like, oh, I listen, I could breathe because I was, and I think it also forced us to grow up earlier and sooner so that I was actually probably more emotionally further along than a lot of my um, uh, friends in high school. So by the time I got to college as a freshman, wow, you know, I, this is great. You know, I can do my own, I'm responsible to go to class. You know, I, um, I was very lucky in my piano training. I, I was able to pass out of all the first year music history and theory classes. So um, I could really find my own path. I decided I would do pre-med as well as music. And so I had all of this and I was just exciting. And like, that was the first time in college that I thought, okay, I like the United States. I figured this out. Um, so it's very complicated. That's a great question. I can see how, um, I, I, I actually, I, there's a case in point, for example, with, and I saw this in Japan, the, the teacher I studied with in high school, um, Michiko Miyamoto, one of the finest piano teachers in Seattle. Um, she had 
and tough as nails, but taught me so much. And she had so many students that were um, Japanese kids of the Japanese businessmen and diplomats that would come to Seattle for their three-year stint in the reverse of what I was had done. And I would see, especially the young women, these teenage girls, you know, the first year they're afraid, they're scared. And second year, they get it. Third year, when they have to go back to Japan, it's really impossible because you've now let them out of that societal restrictive box of how a woman is supposed to act. And even in Japan, there's a separate language. There's a separate, you know, watashi wa boku wa. There's different for me, I, male, female versions. So you have to, um, it's hard for them once they've experienced that openness of, uh, especially American, what I call West Coast American, which is very different than even Midwest and East Coast. Yes. Um, it's hard for them to get pushed back into that box again. So a lot of them have a difficult time and then they choose to come back and go to college in the States and then they, they live a Western life. So I think now I've been watching some videos on uh, Japan, life in Japan with uh, Westerners going over there to live and, and half Western, half Japanese people. And it seems less now because I think as an international society, we have so much better communication skills and understanding through the internet, through even YouTube, understanding other cultures and at least being a little bit, I would like to think a little bit more um, open about that and being able to not just see the world through my own personal lens. Um, and most of the comments I've seen by these people who go to Japan say it's a little bit difficult, but it's not as hard as I think it would have been at one point. So, um, but that's a, that's a great question. And especially if I think about Italian versus American, even West Coast, it's very, very different. Completely. Very, very different. I want to ask you one more question about Mandarin, and then I'll proceed with this thread. But you brought up Mandarin. Because I don't speak Mandarin, but because I my understanding is that where the voice is pitched, oh yeah, <laughs> at what octave let's call it, it can have a different meaning. Number one, it requires the kind of listening skills that I imagine English does not. That's number one. But number two, you as a musician, did your listening skills develop? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. My mother, bless her. So she grew up in Shanghai, went to a Chinese Catholic girls school. So she spoke Shanghainese and this would have been, uh, she left around 51, 52 when the bamboo curtain fell down. My aunt, her older sister went to a British girls school. So she spoke only British English and not Chinese. And then my uncle went to a Chinese boys school. So he spoke, spoke mostly Chinese, but his English was very good. So my mother, when she married, my, when she moved, she escaped. They, they got her to Hong Kong to live with her, uh, my grandmother's, her aunt, my grandmother's sister. She had to then learn Cantonese, which is a completely, Mandarin, uh, Shanghai, and, and then they moved to Taiwan. My, my dad moved to Taiwan, she had to learn Mandarin. So my, there's three completely different. It's not even like, for example, the difference in Abu Dzeze and, uh, um, Bolognese or you know, Napolitano. It, it, right. It's completely different. Um, and so, and Mandarin has five tones. If I'm, I may be wrong, but I think Cantonese has like 11 tones. Mm -hmm. And these tones are the things. So I, I finally, my first, and my mom, when she married my dad, it was that, that mentality in the 60s. Well, my kids are going to be American. They're going to speak English, you know. So here's my mom speaking three dialects and not speaking Chinese to us as a children. And um, which I really regret that she had, yes. but it would be great if I could speak in a little Mandarin. So when I finally got to high school, uh, college, I took, in addition to being pre-med, I took Mandarin and University of Washington, along with Yale, have the two of the finest Sino studies, Chinese studies in uh, programs. And, um, and in fact, the Chinese that I was learning was the new simplified characters. And my mom only, only learned the complicated old fashioned characters. So she couldn't even read my homework. And I was living at home that year. So I'd come home and just proudly try to practice with her. And she would always start laughing, say, oh, you sound, in Chinese, you can say, you sound like such a foreign devil, which is kind of a, a, right. a, a light joking, teasing, you know, you're a foreign devil. And I said, mom, I'm a musician, I'm a piano, I, and I can hear the tones, but I can't reproduce them in my, in my um, throat, in my mouth. And so, uh, and, and there's a funny, there's a funny tongue twister they teach you sometimes, and you can take the word ma, M-A, and depending on, if you go ma, ma, ma or ma or ma just the neutral like a, a little circle thing they mean 
the word for mother, the word for horse, the word, the verb to scold, the word for hemp, and the question article that just to come in. Ni hao, ni hao ma, how are you? You put the ma on the end terms of the question. Um, and so you can do theoretically a ma, 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 ma. Is mom scolding the hemp horse? <laughs> <laughs> you say that to your Chinese friends and they're like, what? Oh yeah, well, we would never say that. <laughs> I learned a German tongue twister that's kind of similar. Ben fliegen hinter fliegen 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 nach. <laughs> when flies well, then, fly behind flies, flies fly behind flies. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, other thing about the tones is that they they alter. Their, it, it's it's like Nico's uh, Nico Castell's vocalic conversation, where like an open close ease. Tell, and close I know I knew Nico. Tell us who Nico Castell was. Nico Castell was one of the great character tenors. Saying, "Oh God, what." How many roles at the Met and you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of performances. He also was a master linguist and spoke so many languages beautifully and so he ended up he became one of the top um, diction coaches for opera singers in New York for many many years and then he's written translations literally word-for-word -word translations of all of the major operas like all of Mozart's operas, all of Verdi, all of uh, Puccini, um, Rossini, uh, most of the big Rossini ones then all the big standard ones and even some of the Russian he went into. Um, and he talks about this vocalic conversation, like I Italian has open and closed E's and, you know, so is it um, sempre, sempre, you know, which ought, you know, you can, as he, you can go, he said, you can go to Zingarelli, the big dictionary and look at what is correct. But he said, you know, it's going to be in the North, Central and South are going to be completely, you know, sometimes they open it more, sometimes they close it. So it depends if you want to go or you want to go high field at high Florence and, you, you know, then you go to, you'd see what they say there. But, but he says, but when you have a bunch of E's and O's in a row, some are open, some are closed. You can cheat them. You can open some and they all, they, so Chinese does the same. So when you have some of those difficult up, down, up, you can just turn them into a down or turn them into up depending on what you're coming from just before it. So that, that was another layer of complexity, you know, and it just really confounded me as a musician. I can hear it, mm -hmm. but it was difficult to get the, the, the shape and the bounce of that. Um, and I find Mandarin incredibly beautiful. It's a very, to me, it reminds me a lot of uh, French and Italian. It has that, that the Zlanjo, it has that sing-songy and the stress that got da 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 further in. Um, and it's so expressive. Um, Shanghainese is a little bit sharper. The ch becomes like a tz. You'll know somebody speaking Shanghainese when you hear a lot of tz, tz, the T-S, um, sao, so, so, instead of zhou, so, so, so. Um, Cantonese, yeah, so Cantonese can, is very sharp, you know. The Shanghainese do that so they can slurp their soup dumplings without getting it on their shirt. <laughs> um, so you were talking about the different tones in different dialects or languages of China. And one of them was a five tone, the other an 11. So the five tone is like pentatonic. Mm -hmm. And the 11 tone is almost second Viennese. Yeah, yeah. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom used to joke when she became a flight attendant at Cathy Pacific and she was learning and she had to learn Cantonese and she said, I had to do the safety demonstration. And she said, sometimes the passengers would laugh because here I'm speaking Cantonese, probably with my very strong Shanghainese accent. Mm -hmm. And she said, I knew I probably would say things like, oh, in case of landing, throw throw yourself out the window or throw, throw, your, <laughs> throw the dog out the window or something, you know? <laughs> um, one more thing about essere spiazzati, in other words, to be a bit here and there in the world. Um, someone recently, who I don't know, wrote to me and said that she read something in a book I had written 26 years ago. And I'm paraphrasing. I think I said, Lucky is the man who is born in the place where he's supposed to be. Almost as lucky is the man and woman, of course, who early in life discovers the place where he's supposed to be and gets to be there. And less lucky, but still lucky, is the person who eventually finds the place where he is supposed to be. Most unlucky are those who are not able to ever find that place. Um, I did that in describing the Italian region of Liguria because I love New York City, obviously, and I have a lot of New York values, whatever those are. But the place where I most deeply discovered myself and understood that I was completely at one in the location and the topography and the food and the people 
who the Ligurians are not like most other Italians, but somehow I completely connected with Liguria. And I later discovered so did Giuseppe Verdi. And <laughs> our value systems, he's my hero as a man, I'm not saying as a musician, but as a man, um, many of those value systems that we found in Liguria, Giuseppe and I, align and were important to him and important to me. And it helped me understand what I appreciate about Verdi through understanding what he found so meaningful in Liguria. Then there's the beautiful nature, at least beautiful to me. Then there's the fantastic food, at least fantastic to me. And so I have a dear friend from South Africa who now lives in Oklahoma, but she's been everywhere. And she describes herself as having been washed with all of the waters of the world. And wow. because she's lived on the West Coast of the United States, the East Coast, Germany, England, Israel, Africa, many Holland, many, many other places. And I've never quite asked her where she feels most at home and, and herself. I would guess South Africa, but maybe Britain. I'm not sure, I just don't know. You have this comparable experience, so with different locales. Have you yet found the place where you are the most you? I think the two places that my husband Sam and I are at now. So Seattle, there's something about Seattle. When I come home from a trip and I would fly in, I could breathe again. Even just, you know, I could see the trees and landing in, in, in SeaTac looking out the window, all of a sudden I could feel my pulse relax and I'm, I could breathe. And, and, and I've always been drawn to the land, to the beauty, the mountains, the, the ocean, the food of that area of the Pacific Northwest. And, and, and I would go hiking so many times up in the mountains just by myself to do a day hike and, and recharge. I remember when I turned 30, I went out to Olympic Peninsula on my birthday and just hiked up a ridge and sat there and watched the sunset and you know knew that one decade of my life was over and I'm starting a new decade and it just felt right to do that um and the other place is in, in Abruzzo um, you know and I don't know why and probably and you because mentioned your like, husband Sam is he is Sam, his origin Abruzzese is that why you wound up there yes it's part of his origins uh so um He's, let's see if I get this right. And Sam's probably watching from the house in Abruzzo right now. <laughs> they so, <absolutely>. um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's half Abruzzese, uh, third generation from South Jersey, Philly. Um, half Abruzzese, quarter Calabrian and quarter Siciliano. Mm -hmm. so, um, so his mom was uh, Sicilian Abruzzese. His dad was Calabrese Abruzzese. And, uh, and so we had gone, the first time we went there, took his parents to Italy in 97, we went to Abruzzo to visit his father's in Colonella in the, in the little town there, um, in Sinteramo province, uh, about 40 minutes north of Pescara and right next to um, San Benedetto del Tronto. We're right on the border of Le Marche. Um, you can wave to it across the river. And, um, and so we've been going kind of ever since 97. And it's because it felt like a second home, but I, I've done a lot of, once we bought the house a few years ago and I sit there and just look at it and it, it hit me. It's like, okay, if I squint, I feel like I'm home in Seattle. It has, for me, Abruzzo has the same qualities. It has, and I, I know I'm oversimplifying, but sometimes you have to overgeneralize, simplify to, to find the connections. This is actually what we musicians do too when we study scores. Um, it's like Shankarian analysis of countries or cultures in a way, just reduce it to its most base element. Um, you have, especially where we are in Teramo province, you have the mountains, the Apennine mountains with the Gran Sasso, which we can see from one side. You have the ocean, the Adriatic on the other side. You have the beach cities and the towns and the cuisine of the seafood. You have the cuisine of the mountains, the, the lamb, um, the great wine, everything that's exactly the same in Seattle and the Northwest. We have great land from Eastern Washington, all the great wines from Eastern Washington, we have all the great seafood on the coast. And then you have this kind of these two cuisines coming together in this incredible landscape in, in, in Abruzzo, you have the Parco Nazionale, where hiking is a big passion there. And it's the, the highest are now, mountains of, of the Italian peninsula as opposed to the yeah. Italian Alps. 
Yeah, yeah. But on the actual yeah. peninsula, those are the highest mountains, and they're in the middle yeah. of the country. There's snow in the hours of Rome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so all of these Italians are, have discovered it. For a long time, we were the playground of the Bolognese and the Milanese. In fact, we have uh, neighbors across uh, us who come down from Milano um, in the summertime to, to their condo in the building across from us. And uh, it's it just for, and I look at pictures of myself, like, you know, on Facebook or whatever, and I thought, wow, I, I look so relaxed. I look, you know, I can, it's the same thing. I go there and I breathe and, and time ceases to exist and I, we just fall into that that italian especially that sent the centro it's really centro we're farthest we're the farthest north in the south you can get so it's still technically suit but it's really and now but it says it themselves you know, we're, we are more centro especially up there in Tenemo yeah. province yeah. but it's it's a different culture it's it's not it's not like the north where it's a little bit more intense it's not like the south where it can be a little more laid back it just feels right to me and to us and um i love the food there i love the wines i mean in our valley alone in valley vibrata there are like three phenomenal uh, canteen wineries there that that produce excellent stuff you know and the and the, and, and the food and the and the, the food is it it's it's a different kind of cuisine it's it's not fancy it's simpler it's more pure, and and again, I find if I if I simplify it to an extreme, I find the French roots from when the French kind of ruled that area. You know, we use a lot of sofrito, you know, the, a lot of celery, a lot of carrots, onions. Um, in other words, the starting flavors and, and fragrances in a stew, in a pasta sauce, in a meat dish. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of meat consumed in Abruzzo. A lot of meat as well, the, the arrosticini, which is, you know, yeah. sublime if you do it well. And, oh, here's a funny side story. Arrosticini so being different parts of the sheep that are typically it's, it's, not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and well, no, actually, if you, it, it should be the uh, young, the best one is the young lamb, and it's cut in tiny little cubes. And then they have the special fat that's between each cube, and it's on a skewer. And it's usually about nine, 80 cents to a, one euro for a skewer, and... Um, it's put in a brocca in the pitcher, and then you uh, bring it to the table. It's grilled very fast. It's never marinated. That's the big thing. It's mm -hmm. not like a spiedini where you would marinate it, and you can marinate in all kinds of stuff like they would do in the states. But it's the it's the pure, unadulterated lamb, which is spectacular. Yeah. And, so, and then grilled very on a very high wood charcoal, very quickly and turned. And that's the trick. It's you have to have a great sense of the time. Only about a minute and a half, two minutes aside. Till it's caramelized and crispy and then juicy and then sprinkled with sea salt and that's it and and you have a skewer of that with a glass of Montepulciano d'Abruzzo right off the farmer from the cantina and it's it's the definition of terroir you know it's like you, you feel it okay, is this, um but also this is what happens you know Abruzzo for people who don't know it um is the region of Italy that was the last to be Christianized Oh, yeah. The Catholic Church got to every other region, even though it's pretty close to Rome, because in part the mountains, but also because Abruzzo historically had a lot of pagan traditions, and I yes. believe in pagan traditions, so that's not a negative judgment. <laughs> in other words, uh, polytheist, there was not just one God. And in this regard, it was very different from, well, pre-Christian Italy or the Italian peninsula was polytheist. But after most of the peninsula converted to Catholicism, Abruzzo remained for several centuries polytheist and worshipped its own gods, had its own festivals, its own uh, sagre, they're called, yes. devoted to different beings, to gods. They have these traditions based on the number seven, so that there's a soup called the Sete Virtu, mm -hmm. where you find seven virgins, which was possible then, and each would bring seven ingredients and they would produce a soup made with 49 ingredients. And there was something about the number seven in the mythology of good luck, I'm not just in Abruzzo, that we still see these traditions. There's something called the Panarda. The Panarda, yes. Which is <laughs> a big <laughs> pagan feast that, you know, we think of as being like ancient Rome where people pig out and and eat abundantly for days but it still happens in yes. 
a brood. So it does in Liguria, we eat a fried cod ball and that's that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the, in, in Abruzzo, the people joke other Italians joke about it because the quantity, the portion sizes are huge. You know, the quantities of food are yeah. enormous. And uh, we were sitting at a um uh, and, and the food is phenomenal. And even at the the, the super coin at the the, the, Part, the, mall, the, at the bottom of our yeah. hill supermarket um has this incredible cafeteria restaurant in the back that will go and it's like you can get I can we can get a complete lunch you know three course lunch with wine for like eight euros and it's mm-hmm. really good especially if the big guy the head chef is cooking you see him behind and I was we were there once and um and I saw these Italian businessmen coming it's all office workers businessmen which also means it's yes you know it's really really consistently good food and these guys came in and obviously uh, there were some northern Italians and the one I would say is a businessman and I heard him say to him because the, the northerners looked at like oh we're in a cafeteria what is this you know and the guy said just watch out this food is really really good you know and I saw them eating at the table and they were just like scarfing and filling their you know it was it was it's, it's very it's a unique culture on when Sam, Sam's um, I believe it was was it his 40th birthday I we threw a panada there for him in the house in Seattle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and three we really days? Had, was it no, the full no, three no. days? It was one night. We, we did a revised, <laughs> simplified a panardina. A panardina, yeah. I think we still had 40 courses. You could, yeah. We tried to keep it to a certain number. And then you have to have something for all the senses. So we hired a massage therapist to sit down in the family room downstairs and to do like head, foot, and neck massages for people. We had a little band uh, playing, a little jazz band playing, so senses for the ears. And then uh, we had all this food laid out, you know, and it's it was it was quite something. And I thought, yeah, you know. Yeah, the, the so obvious is have a certain paganism. Mystery. Yeah, yeah, I can you see know, the so, yeah. know about 40, 40th birthdays. My 40th birthday, I was in Beijing climbing oh, the Great Wall of China. And <laughs> the elevator, this was, believe me, before a lot of the modernization of China. And the elevator that was to take us to the top of the wall broke. And I decided I've come all the way to China. I'm climbing this wall. It's been hours climbing up there, but it was <laughs> a thrilling. It was one of those things that you want to do to mark that day. And it was my 40th birthday. Anyway, um, many people who join us on this program join us to talk about music. Mm-hmm. And you are a very accomplished musician and a well-regarded conductor. And I have known many people who have worked with you and the... Yeah. <laughs> the feedback is all positive. And you are one of your titles is your music director of Nashville Opera. So you live in Seattle. You are music director of Nashville Opera. Let's start by talking about Nashville. I had not been there until four years ago. And I'd always wanted to go. It's known as Music City. And obviously, we think of country and western for Nashville. Tennessee is a horizontal state, and in the east part of the state is bluegrass, and the middle is country and western. In the western part of the state, Memphis is soul and, and a lot of blues. Mm-hmm. And to me, Tennessee has always been remarkably interesting and attractive and contradictory in that it has all of this intense music culture, and many people I respect have gone to live in Tennessee, especially mm-hmm. Nashville. And Al Gore comes from near Nashville. And we cannot ever generalize about places in the United States. But there is this intense devotion to music I discovered in Nashville. And not just country and Western and uh, Dolly Parton, who I love anyway, and all of that. But there's a symphony. There is a portion of the city that devotes itself to things classical. There's a recreation of the Parthenon from Athens Mm -hmm. in Nashville. Um, And there is the opera and they've just Mm -hmm. opened a new concert hall or opera hall. Is that correct? That you Uh, inaugurated with Das Rheingold. So tell it. Yeah, we, uh, it it was, it's at Belmont University. So Nashville also has quite a few very fine institutions like Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. And and so Belmont is right next, it's the next school over like a few blocks away from Vanderbilt. So they just built a a new, uh, the public number is $180 million uh, concert hall. And it's literally, it's, oh my God, it's like 
being at a, a beautiful opera house in Italy or concert hall. It, it's got the, the U-shaped auditorium with the levels up. Uh, seats about seven, 1,700 people. Um, spectacular acoustics and it's drop dead gorgeous uh, lobby into the auditorium. The, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. So we were the very first, it opened earlier this year. So we're the first big production to take the hall to the acoustic, to challenge the hall acoustically by putting this, this Das Feingold on stage, it's new production. Um, and it was, it was just an incredible experience. Um, the singers loved it. Uh, the orchestra sound it was at Carnegie Hall. It just shot out into the house with the most beautiful singing, sweet, effortless tone. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a symphony geek, shall we say, he, he started crying on the tune when he heard the tuning, because he said, when the strings came in on that A, he says, oh my God. And he, he said, it was just so gorgeous and um you know compared to other places that you know he's in other opera houses and, and multi-purpose auditoriums which is the, the bane of the existence of a lot of uh, north american opera companies that we we are forced to go into these these big huge three four thousand seat auditoriums with that are really tuned more for the broadway shows so they're going to be a little bit more dampened because you're using a, a amplified sound instead of acoustical sound so we want a little more hang in the air uh, for vocal music, for symphonic, especially music coming out of a pit into the house. And that's what the Fisher Hall, Fisher Performing Arts Center gives us. Um, so it, it was a thrill and, and uh, I was so excited about it. But you're right, Nashville is amazing city and the, the, the music runs deep there. And uh, our orchestra um, is, for the opera orchestra, is all some of the best freelancers in town. And Nashville is still one of the leading centers for recorded music. Um, a few years ago, it hasn't been released yet, but it should, hopefully it will come out soon. We recorded Carly Simon at the opera, Carly Simon's um, opera Romulus Hunt, which was written for the Met and Kennedy Center back in 91, I think. And so we did a new recording of it complete with all of the music that she had originally written, put back in, um, recorded it at Music Row, at. Uh, Oceanway Studios, which is one of the finest. Everybody, Yo-Yo Ma, the Marsalis Brothers, Dolly Parton, uh, Taylor Swift, they have all recorded there. And it's a, it's a uh, converted church. And you walk in and you see, you can feel, it's like walking into the Met. You feel the vibes. You feel the energy of all those great artists that went before you. You feel it there. And um, so we recorded that. And so her arranger, Thies Goal, a wonderful uh, Swiss German, uh, he does a lot of um, main big movies orchestrates that Oscar winner and we were sitting around and he, he came to the first re re rehearsal with the orchestra and he said oh my god I don't re I don't orchestrate this that was me 20 years ago when I wrote that I, said, I want to make all these changes so here we have an orchestra full of studio musicians and he starts talking to them like and, and they start everybody's picking it up okay guys change that do that do that do that do that and it was amazing to watch them and how versatile they were and um, and then I was talking to him later, and he said, you know, this is you know you're you live you know you're working in one of the top music recording. He said it's still in his eyes, it's still London, Prague, and Nashville are the top three. Um, things have pretty much shut down in the recording industry for the film industry in New York and um, L.A. Uh, New York still has the whole stranglehold on all of the the wonderful Broadway cast albums because they have this infrastructure to do that, and the people are there. Um, but it, it's, it's incredible. If I encourage anybody who comes to Nashville, go to the Country Music Hall of Fame Museum. It is the top, hands down, it is the top music museum in the world. The well, I don't know if I agree with you, but I think it's a wonderful museum and I was happy to go there, but I wouldn't quite go top music museum in the world. <laughs> if you, for, I, for me, it is. And, I, and I've been to some of the other big ones around and I love, for example, the Nazionale in, in Pesaro. It's spectacular and high end and all of that. But in terms of how it's curated, how they present what they're presenting. So, you know, they don't try to go into classical, but what they do with that whole end of the business. And you can also see in the center area where it's the glassed in walls, the curation. So all of these famous um, singers and, and pop singers and country singers are donating a lot of their memorabilia and estate and everything is curated and handled beautifully. And the, the way they present stuff chronologically, it's just, and the history of even the electric development, electric guitar and all of that. I find it fascinating you could spend hours there and it's kind of you spiral up and down through the whole thing but the whole city that the amount of the playing and so our orchestra and the opera orchestra is all 
uh, studio musicians and, free, and some of the best faculty in town. We have some of the symphony players when they're available. Um, and it's so good that, I hate to say this, but for many of our operas, we can do everything on one reading. Mm -hmm. So we'll do the reading from two to five in the theater pit. We then do the, those are your classical musician, my colleagues who are watching will understand the, the, the scariness and the enormity of this, but we'll do the reading from two to five. We take a dinner break. The singers join us for the Zitzbondel from seven to 10. Then we do so two or explain orchestra. Zitz, because not everybody's in our profession. What is a Zitz? It sounds it's, like a shower, but. <laughs> <laughs> You're showered with beautiful music. Um, the Zitz is the point, when you put an opera together, you do it in layers and so that we can all keep our wits about us. And I think what a lot of viewers may not understand is how disorienting it is for the singer on stage. They can't really hear the orchestra that well because they are behind the sound and the sounds in the pit and it goes up and out before it. So it's not coming up and at them. So a lot of times they'll see my hand go down and then because of the distance, they will hear the sound about a quarter to half a second later. So they have to learn to judge. At the Met, for example, it can be one whole beat ahead. So if you're at the if you if you're singing at the back wall of the Met, like that half city block back, you literally have to sing almost one full beat ahead of the orchestra so that your voice lines up with the pit by the time it gets to the house. And that's what the prompter's job at the Met. They they know exactly where you have to be in if you're 20 feet up stage versus 30, 40 feet up stage. So what you do is um, I get the orchestra ready for the singers and then we add the singers the next layer. So you don't want to ask the singers to run around on stage and have to act and sing and everything. So we say, just stand, stand there, sing with us, use your eyes to program your eyes and ears, what the delay is in this particular theater, because every theater will be different. Every orchestra is different. Some orchestras play way behind the beat, you know, Vienna style. Um, um, so it's almost like when my hand is at the top, they'll be, that's where the singer will hear the, the, the beat. Um, so you have to add that into the mix. And it's incredibly disorienting for the singers. And I have great respect for them. I never understood it till I had to be on stage in Seattle when I was pianist there to prompt and uh, prolect and Ariadne. And we don't have a propter's box. So they, they hid me on stage behind this door, go, we'll put a tablecloth on it. And I could be there and I could hear for the first time what the singers were hearing. And I almost had a heart attack. It was like, oh my God, no wonder. You know, and it completely changed and gave me incredible respect for my singer colleagues because I thought, okay, this, it's, 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 it's such a difficult uh, job they have to do. So what we do is we have the orchestra, we add them on. So all they have to do that night is a zitz probe means we stand in one's place or sit in one place and you sing to the orchestra. So you begin to train, you're also training the orchestra what tempo you want, because if they see the, the tempo and, and the rubato or the taking the time in my arm and they hear the singer do it, then the orchestra starts to understand, oh, that's what the maestro and the soprano want to do, for example, in Simi um, uh, Mimi, for example. Um, uh, and all the Puccini rubato. Um, and then after that, then we go to the first orchestra desk and that's when you can then say to the singers, okay, now you've programmed what, how, to, how your ear and brain and mouth have to work and your breath management. So when you take the breath in, when the singer breathes in, that's the same thing as my giving the upbeat. And that's, I, I equate it to, let's say you're at the airport and you're gonna step on the moving sidewalk. You're not gonna go right up to the edge of that stop look down and then gent gingerly put your foot. You're gonna to try to get your body moving so you, you get onto the moving sidewalk at the same point. That's what the singer is trying to do with the orchestra. And they're also training the orchestra. Like if I need a certain tempo, I will take either a fast intake breath or a long intake breath. And I can then through ESP, through my breath, talk to the conductor and to the orchestra. And, and I always tell singers, you can bypass a bad conductor with your breath. You can just talk directly to the concert mistress master to the orchestra because they will breathe with you if they, they don't have to hear your breath, but they have to feel your breath. And there's a way that you can transmit that information. When I, being an opera conductor, I'm constantly looking at people's bodies and saying, in some theaters, I can't, I can barely hear the singers because their voices go over your head. Uh, so I will lip, I'm reading lips, but I'm also watching, I'm watching shoulders, um, clavicle, sternum, um, jaw, face. I'm looking for any any hint of see me, you know, where that lift 
and then that lean. I'll, I'll know even, I don't even have to see the mouth go into do the S. I'll see, I'll know exactly where she's um, going to pronounce that word. Um, if you do it right, you and the singer eventually don't even have to look at each other. It's like ESP, it's like chamber music. It should be like chamber music. You know, it shouldn't be conductor rules, singer rules, orchestra rules. We're all in this together. And if you can find that magic mixture where we all trust each other and we all give each other a little bit of leeway and we all listen to each other and we play off of each other, it is the most exhilarating, phenomenal experience in the world. It's almost like you're, you're dancing, you're waltzing with somebody and you know exactly where they're gonna make me do a turn or they're gonna to wanna to do a spin out or you've got another couple coming, so let's, let's nudge over a little this way. And it's just the most, I can't explain it, but when it's working, it's almost like you're flying, you know. It's Better than like a massage an therapist experience. at a meal? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Better than a massage therapist at a meal. That one was new to me. <laughs> no, that would be great also. But no, it, it's just, it, it's an incredible, opera is a whole different creature, you know, than, than ballet conducting or symphony conducting. And that's why there are men and women like me who end up being pretty much only opera conductors. And, you know, I, I've, it's my metier. It's, some, it's what I've spent, you know, 30 years in starting as a rehearsal pianist for 15 years before. And I never wanted to conduct. And a lot of my colleagues are like me. We never, I didn't go to school to be a conductor. I've never had a conducting lesson. Nobody would let me study. I tried I, when I, and I was being nudged uh, in that direction. And, you know, one of the first singers that recognized that was, God bless her, Carol Vaness, you know, and, and I was playing a, a Traviata in my first job in Seattle in 1988. And by the second day, she came to, you're going to be a conductor someday. You want to be a conductor. Don't you? I said, no, Carol, I don't. <laughs> I said, why? She says, I don't know. You, you play like one and you, you think like one, you talk like one. And there, there's something about you. And I said, no, 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 no. Because as a conductor, as a pianist in an opera company, like when you're playing flute or, you know, anything that has a keyboard, they always stick you behind the brass section. So you hear the comments, the, the rough comments, sometimes the orchestra can make about the person on the podium. And I'm like, ooh, that's a hot seat. I don't ever want to be up there. And, and I probably assisted 70 something conductors in various companies before I picked up the baton and tried to conduct myself. So I've seen people struggle with it. I see how difficult it was. And I said, mm, I don't know if I want to do that. And then I eventually did, but you know, I tried to talk to several conductors that I respected and like Eduardo Mueller, you know, for example, I said, Maestro, when you're at the Met, I will come. And, no, 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 I won't let you. You're doing what I did, what Schulte did, what all, you're doing the classic old school. You need to be a repetitor, which means you, you play the whole full score in, a, in an opera house, in the rehearsal stage and rehearsal six hours a day. You're singing all the parts. I mean, countless times I've been in rehearsal where you know, there's a, a Valkyrie once and the, the Brunhilde said, Dean, I don't feel like singing today. Sing my part in the stage. And I'm like, okay. And you're sitting there or somebody- You are tall and blonde. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. So it's, it's, it's a craft you learn. It's a, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a whole, it's like learning. It's like studying to be a doctor. You, you have to go through these stages. You know, you can't, you have to get in your, what Eduardo told me, he said, you need, you need to learn your languages. You need to learn, you need to steep yourself in opera singers. What does a singer need? You have to develop that radar. And I was an opera, I was an accompanist before then, which is how I ended up in, and studied with Marty Katz and how I ended up in. Martin Katz University Martin of Katz, Michigan, yeah. very yeah. famous. Oh, phenomenal, phenomenal. Partner on yeah. the, with the piano, Marilyn Horn and Marilyn everyone, Horn, but famous Flicka, the Marilyn Horn. Judy yeah. Blagan, everybody, you know, and, and, and Marty has, Marty turned on that, like that he has a, he has a way to teach you how to turn on the radar in your head for where a singer is. And he would have us in class. Uh, I studied with him in Blossom, the master class. And we'd have, we would have to get up Blossom and sing. In Ohio. Blossom, Ohio. I'm filling in because we have <laughs> listeners around the world who may not know that Blossom is the music festival near Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland Symphony, Cleveland Orchestra is involved yeah. in that. And, and um, so, you know, he would have us get up and sing like Out of Band, a simple Italian song, and, and another piano student would, would accompany you. And you're, you're sitting there and you're like, oh, this is, you're pushing me. Stop, don't, don't, you didn't, you didn't give me time to breathe, you know? And you, you start to learn what it's like for the singer standing there. And so I had gone through all those steps. And, um, and then at some point, you know, if, if you have it or not, you know, and, and the, I remember the first time it was a flater mouse or everything possible that could go wrong. And, you know, in Eastern Washington, on a New Year's Eve gala performance and the pass was closed. We couldn't get over. So my 
my orchestra reading became the final dress rehearsal. I had one and that was it. And, and I was in a corner and the singer's behind my, and I'm like this connecting. And I, you know, the baton flies out of my hand and the overture and it lands in the second violins and you know, everything that could go wrong. And I remember going back to the hotel room and I was like, wow, that was thrilling. And, and I didn't get nervous. And I thought, and I felt like I came home when I got on the podium. You know, whereas a pianist, I played all over the world and it's like, I st would still get nervous accompanying singers and I was a solo pianist. And, but on the podium, it's like, I rarely ever get nervous. And when I do, it, it zaps me in. I just, I just go into that, boom kind of mentality so you know and, and and that's the classic way you you, you are so steeped in the, the art of opera the art every and everything about it um and i remember i was for artistic director of opera cleveland for three years and i didn't know how to produce opera and my, my, my agent at the time said you know more than you think and i will teach you i'll give you my opera 101 class if you need and he was right i started I wrote that book know, yeah, <laughs> opera production 101. But he was right. He's like, you know, when, when you live your life in opera companies in the theater, it's the best training because you're also learning on the job. You're seeing five different, you're doing Bohem with five different conductors. So you're seeing five possible ways that you can conduct the score in terms of subdividing. I remember when I did my first one to conduct and I would be so neurotic and I would call Stephen Lord was a, a wonderful conductor and wonderful one conductor. Yeah, one of my mentors, like, Stephen, are 258. Do you do that in eight or four? Do you subdivide this? And he gave me the best advice. He said, and he's tall and lanky like me. And Eduardo was tall and lanky like me too. So I could I had great models there. I could see what they did. And it's like, oh, that works in my body. Um, and, and he said, you know, Dean, do what you need to do now. And in 10 years, I guarantee you, you'll do half as much. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it. I thought well, he's just, you know, playing with my mind or something. And then 10 years later, I'm doing another bow. And I'm like, darn it, he's right. I don't have to do, I'm not working that much at all. I, you know, you get confidence and you can say, I can, I can, I don't have to subdivide this, you know, break it down into individual beats. I can just do one big one. Oh, and my arms are really long, which means I can really do a stretch. I can do, a, I can show rubato. I can show tempo without having to do all these little sub beating subbeats and it becomes simpler and simpler and um it's one of the few things that the, the more you do the better you get the less you have to say to an orchestra and the more you trust yourself and you trust the players and i have to say that's what nashville has also taught me the players are so incredible um and, and play at such a high skill level and they can play anything in any style and they do it with a smile on their face and the first show i did with the freelancers was uh, uh barbara seville and i had i probably done a hundred something performances of that and i remember i always had the style okay guys gentlemen ladies and gentlemen here we go the italian overture style double dot on the beat ba -da, not bum bum this not magic fluid is barbara still I, we get it, we get it, let's just do it, let's just do it. Oh, okay. And as long as I was clear, they stuck to me like glue. They knew the style, it was light, it was fast, it was elegant. And I thought, wow, you know, and they, I have to say, they've taught me to let go of the leash, which is the hardest lesson. We'll get to the lesson. leash in a moment. <laughs> yeah, it's the hardest lesson for most of us conductors yep. to not over control and overthink to just let it go. And at some point you gotta let the music happen. And it takes a lot of trust of the players around you and not trying to control it. And opera's hard because you are stuck between the two planes, the pit and the stage, and they both can't hear each other very well. And I've said this many times, I'm the cream filling the oral cookie that's getting squished like this. <laughs> so, you know, and so you're feeling the orchestra wanted to, or there's a delayed effect because by the time they hear the singer's voice, it's like, you know, the train left the station half a second ago, the singers are having the reverse. And so you're feeling these forces pull like this um, and you're trying to just keep everybody together. And sometimes if you just let go, it all comes together. The more James you try to control it. said to me, when I worked at the Met and, and worked with him a lot, and not just to me, that his approach was all the work is done in rehearsal. And exactly. then in performance, you just let it go. You do it, you yeah. do what you've already rehearsed. And then if it goes in a different direction, if a singer suddenly has no, she didn't have the day before, <laughs> and or more breath or whatever, she suddenly has a high E flat naida, you do it. You do it if she wants to do it. Yeah. And he was yeah. not 
a disciplinarian the way certain conductors are who feel mm -hmm. it has to be my approach or that's it. Now, the serious question, though it sounds like a joke, but it's really not. People around the world know Nashville for the Grand Old Opry. And before I went to Nashville, I knew I was interested in the Grand Old Opry. Country and Western music is not my favorite genre, but I don't dislike it. I just don't know it as well. But it has roots in folk music and Scots Irish. It's a, you know, mm -hmm. it's a very yeah. serious, valid art form that I just came to know better. But the performances originally were done in an auditorium that was known as the Grand Old Opry, because in America, for people not watching, there are many theaters in the South and especially the, the Plains in the Western United States that are called an opera house. Mm -hmm. And you can go to very small cities in Michigan or Montana or Colorado or Arizona or Tennessee and you'll have a building that's called an opera house, even if they didn't do opera there much at all. You may have had Jenny Lynn touring in the 19th century and singing there, but it wasn't necessarily devoted to opera. So because the city Nashville is so famous for its grand old Opry, which is the grand theater of country Western music, where in the perception of people locally is the Nashville Opera, and do you have to explain, or where does opera stand in the in the um, eyes and hearts of the people of Nashville? Uh, opera for what it is, opera. You know, I don't think there's any confusion. Uh, I I think many Nashvilleians are very proud of the opera company. It, it's been very, it's incredibly well run. There's a very supportive uh, board and donor base. Um, the, the quality of the productions is so great. And John Humes, our general director and um, artistic director has such an incredible vision for not only the classics, but um, producing so many contemporary operas. And we have a lift center series where, where the, op the opera rehearsal hall is turned into a, a, a black box theater and we'll do um, contemporary operas, one act operas, chamber operas, premieres of new operas. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's just, I think it, for me, the Nashville opera, that, that variety of repertoire puts a face onto what Nashville is all about, the music scene in Nashville is all about. It's so versatile, it's so deep. And so, and you have the Nashville Symphony, which is really phenomenal. And, and there's Scammerhorn Concert Hall, which is beautiful. Yes. And then it, the, what you're talking about, the old Grand Old Opry is in the old Ryman Auditorium, which was, yes. I believe, a converted congregational church or something, because it has that big, giant open space and balcony above. And it's all wood. The acoustics are phenomenal. Um, I made my debut in Nashville Opera, I think it was in 2007, with uh, Gounod, Romeo, and Juliet. So I remember going to, in November, it was in fall, so November, around November, December, they go from the new Grand Old Opry out in the, where it is kind of away from downtown, they go back to the Ryman Auditorium. And I'd never gone to a taping, so I went to a taping and it's what um, Prairie Home Companion was based on. So yes, the, the, it's based on, I think Garrison it's Garrison Keillor's very famous radio show yeah. for decades. Yeah, and so it's the in Grand Lake Old Opry. Minnesota, yeah. Yeah, and the Grand Old Opry is based on I think four or five 30 minute segments. And at the beginning of each one is a different bluegrass band ensemble. And it is spectacular. And, and that was the first time I saw, I, I was listening to these, these bluegrass ensembles come on and hearing, um, it was like this virtuoso Rossini orchestra. They were playing faster than any classical musician, yeah. you know, mandolin, violin and everything. And faster than any classical musician I'd ever heard. I, it was just, it blew me away and I thought, oh my God. And then these country singers would come on in this Wood Ryman Auditorium and I could hear their voices even off mic, just careening around. And, and they would sing, they sing in tune with no auto tune, no auto correct. And it just, I thought, wow, this is really yeah. amazing, you know? So, and, and now the Ryman because... Auditorium has a very respectable cafeteria next to it where yeah. I had unusually good food before the show. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't go to Nashville with preconceptions. I went to, to it for a wedding of a very dear friend whose wife was from Nashville, but also because I stayed a few days because I wanted to discover what made it Music City. 
and I walked around, I gave a lecture at Vanderbilt and I had a wonderful time because I found a genuine love of music in addition to all the partying and the tourism and the bachelorette buses of young women getting drunk and all of that. But there was also, you walk into little clubs and the musicians just sitting there playing while people exactly. were drinking were kind of remarkable. You don't know who's going to get up. Uh, if you go down to the, the bar Honky Tonk District in Broadway downtown, we call it Nash Vegas now because it, it does feel like yeah. you're in Vegas and it's, you know, Nashville is like the new Seattle and Austin. And it's the new hot hit city and it's growing by leaps and bounds. And the tourism industry is humongous. If you go down to that, the broad, the, the bar district, you never know. There's always somebody famous might get up out of the audience and just hop up on stage and just join in and play because it's mu musicians treating each other seriously and they respect each other. And I remember staying at a hotel by Vanderbilt for one show. We were doing Pantrula at that point. And I walked in and there's like a piano in the lobby there and the, the front desk, I said, oh, you got a grand piano? Oh, yes. You know, well, Neil Diamond just stayed here the, the other night uh, coming through on his tour. And after he and he came off doing his concert that night in the, the giant arena and he came back here and he sat down at the piano in the lobby and just did a 30 minutes for all of us just because he felt like he was wow. so inspired. Yep. And I thought, yeah, that's Nashville. That's Nashville. So I want to actually one more Nashville question, then we'll go on the road. You began, you opened a new theater with Das Rheingold, which is an ambitious undertaking anywhere, anytime. And there are so much stage effects that happen mm -hmm. with, you know, moving down to the Nibelheim and, and building a rainbow bridge and all of that stuff. But that's and the not three my transformations. Question. Transformation. <laughs> that's not my question. The ring cycle begins with Das Rheingold with a famous E flat chord, B flat, mm -hmm. E flat, right? E flat note. It's just the note, yeah, and then the chord. The note, up. yes, that e grows flat. into a chord. Mm -hmm. um, that is the beginnings of the world. It's the bottom of the Rhine, whatever you want to call it. It is rather audacious to baptize a theater with that chord, and if the acoustics are not right, and I'm glad you said they are right. What was it like to really, that was the first note sounded in the in that new theater? That's pretty in impressive. The pit, in opera, there were, there were other concerts through the year, um, but we were the first big opera. use of the pit, an opera. Um, it was amazing. And when, let's see, the first reading, we had two readings for this. So the first, we the theater itself, the lobby reminds me so much of even like um, um, a little bit, uh, like Teatro de Colón, it's got, it's very European. It's Buenos got Aires. Yeah. In Buenos Aires, this gigantic high ceiling lobby was all marble, Madagascar marble. And then there were two giant ballrooms off the side and medium room ballrooms with wood floors. So we we did our first orchestra reading, orchestra alone uh, on Saturday afternoon there. And then Sunday afternoon, we went second reading in the pit. And when I gave that first E flat, when we were in the pit, I knew that would be the first time we really hear it. And even on the podium, I could hear the note just like blooming and hanging in the air. And it just had that plushness and that lush quality. And I knew it was an effortless sound and that the players did not have to lean and push. In fact, we had to tell, we could tell them, okay, now you guys can lay back 10% and just, just sit back in it and not have to dig into your instrument to make it sound. Um, so that it was really quite special. And um, especially in a note as famous and infamous as that low E flat. Um, that, Which in this book, you and I will have to explore another time. Wagner, you know where he realized that note? Where he understood no. that, that Liguria, my region of Italy. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell the long story another time. I wrote, I wrote wow. about it in my book. But yeah, yeah, La Spezia, very specifically, is where wow. the note came to him. Via del Prione, 145. I, can, I know the spot. It, to me, it's a shrine. Next um, time anyway, I'm up there, I will, I will go there and and, and with me. <laughs> You'll bring Sam, we'll eat light. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a little chickpea soup and that's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, one of the things you mentioned to at the beginning of our conversation that I do want to get back to, because it's important, is you are a musician, a conductor in this case, but there are many musicians who do different things in music. 
who is a traveling musician. And I find you now in Louisville, Kentucky, and you're, you will be going to Saratoga Springs. You mentioned before that you're on the road for six months. The first thing I want to ask you about is you were talking about accommodating yourself and musicians in each place you go to, to the sound of the theater, to the conditions of the theater you're in, to the music that you're playing, to having them be quick on the uptake about how notes are dotted, all of that. Um, but then there are the practicalities. You're driving, and I know because he's famous that you have a 13-year-old dog. 15-year-old 15 now. 15-year-old yeah. dog. My little Jack Russell Griffey. And um, I know that he's a discreet gentleman, so he's not joined us today. Unfortunately, he can't. He's, he, sometimes when you pick him up, he gets a little wigged out. He, and so he's invited. I, I he don't want him to have that. a... a a fit on life. <laughs> but because, and let's talk about the fact that a 15 year old dog is 105 in human years. I love the Spanish, años pero. <laughs> he's, he's 105 in años pero. And I know, because you write about this, that you prepare his food and you prepare a special yeah. diet for him, which is sure part of how he got to where he got. So, Talk about the practicalities of being on the road, having a senior dog that has to be attended to, although he gives you a lot of love in return, for whom you prepare special meals. You prepare food for yourself, and I know that you are a very good cook because it's a whole discussion that you and I have had online. Um, securing ingredients. Um, Griffy is the name of your dog. Griffy like certain foods apparently and they're not always easy to find i know that griffey travels with you in a car he's been on airplanes he's gone with you to italy because i've seen him online braving the the mountains of abruzzo and then being down by the sea and he's a he's a trooper as we yeah. say in, in showbiz um talk about the practicalities Nowadays, it's possible to run our financial lives using computers and paying our bills and such. But those other parts of your life, you and Griffey, and you have a husband who is based in Seattle and then spends time at your home in Italy. If you would like to talk about also the fact of a relationship where he is anchored because of his profession to Seattle, whereas you and your profession perforce are on the road. It's, uh, well, you know, Sam and I just had our 30, 30, 31 years coming up. Yeah. And so it's, we, I've been very lucky with Sam and he understands the, the difficult needs of having to be on the road as an itinerant musician. It's, it's life for most of us. Um, and as I said before, I grew up traveling, so I've been very, um, Inventive. I'm a Virgo, so I love the packing. I love the figuring things out. And um, uh, in terms of Griffey, uh, we've had we've always had Jack Russells for about 27 years now. And for a long time, we had the three of them. And uh, just before and during the pandemic, we lost two to old age. Griffey was the last of the pack. So when we had the three, we could never bring them along with us. And so we always had house dog sitters in Seattle. And so um, after Pina, Giuseppina, the little one, Griffey's girlfriend, so she passed away at 17, I believe it was, 17 or 18. Um, I told Sam, I said, we have to take Griffey with us to Italy. And last summer was his first time flying and traveling. So um, uh, I started with, a, we did a Cenerentola here in, uh, in, Nash, in Nashville outdoors um, and a pandemic production. So I knew the first flight would be four hours to Nashville on the nonstop. And so I could introduce him. I took, I got the Sherpa bag, put him under the seat. I took four practice runs to SeaTac. I got him used to the bag, walked him around the airport. SeaTac being um, the airport of Seattle. Yeah, Seattle, Tacoma Airport. And then the flight, he was just perfect. Not a whimper or a, a cry out on takeoff or landing. He's always loved his crate. It's his little man cave, safe place, and his little doggy bed too. So 
being in the carrier and under the seat was just an extension of that. He's loved car rides because the vibration, I think, calms him down. So the, the airplane vibration calmed him down. And then I was a little nervous about the nine hour flight from Newark to Rome. Um, but I flew up to um, Newark, met Sam there, we met there, and then we all flew over last summer to Rome. And I watched the videos on, uh, there's a lot, a lot of videos I recommend you watch if you're gonna fly long distance with your dog, people who live like in Singapore and have to travel from San Francisco. And so they give you, you know, feeding, watering schedule, how to walk you and how to find the grass spots outside of airports. So I, I scoped out, had a three hour layover in Newark. So I knew where the outside, uh, where there was a grassy knoll outside one of the baggage claims and I had enough time to get in and out of security. Uh, we got on the plane to fly over and he curled up and I didn't have to give him any medication. It was like just the ideal travel partner. And then we got there and um, he's always had a little bit of stomach issues. And one of the great discoveries I found um, in Italy, as you know, rabbit is just like chicken at the supermarket and you can get it in, at least in, in, a, in a brutzo. And even rabbit liver, I could get like half a pound for one fifty euro fifty. And, um, and so I thought I'd heard good things about, it. I put him on that and all of a sudden, he just, it just calmed down because it's the, the leanest uh, protein, most digestible protein for older dogs. In fact, it's so lean, you have to make sure you supplement a little bit of extra fat because they won't get enough. Um, so I put him on that organ meats like the, the rabbit liver. Um, and he just loved that with a little bit of his kibble. And then <laughs> arvorio rice, which mm -hmm. I could get, you know, which here in the States is like so expensive for a little thing of it. You know, I yep. could get like, a kilo, so two pounds for like two euros at the supermarket, you know? Um, and so, and because it's also, it's like a uh, short grain rice. So it's softer, it cooks quickly, it's higher in starch and I needed something with more calories. And so it, when in older dogs, when they're sick, we usually say, put them on a, a bland chicken and white rice meal until things calm down. So I thought, how about rabbit and white rice with all these other supplements? So it worked out really well. And then we started traveling with him all around. And last summer we take weekend trips so he, oh, I must say he loved Venice. There was something about, <laughs> yeah. we would take him and walk him around the streets and, and all of the, like I jokingly call the pee mail, you know, you think about the, the, the hundreds of years of dogs that have peed on the sides of all of these, yeah. the, the limestone and sandstone buildings. And so he was just, and all those little streets that, you know, for Jack Russell, it's like, yeah, this is cool. Mm -hmm. And he was just in big heaven. He loved it. He loved to the eighth day. He loved Rome wigged him out a little because it was just too hot by that point yeah. when we got back there and too noisy. But um, we went up to the 13th and Courmayeur and we took the Monte Bianco. We took the gondola up and you can, uh, if you go online, register and all you need is a, a soft muzzle for the dog while it's in the, gond the, the, the gondola up. Took him up to the 13,000 foot level or something, ate at the restaurant up there. You, I love in Italy, you can bring your dogs everywhere except the supermarket, yeah. right. you know? And so, it, it, you know, he became, and he was adapting so well to that. So, you know, so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to do it again this summer. So the only um, thing you have to get past is the EU requires that you do an EU health check from a vet in the United States. And it has to go be signed by the state's USDA vet and have a special, mm -hmm. you know, apostille, special stamp. And then you have to present that when you land. Of course, last summer, I we landed in you know, he's They see me with him in the carrier, you know, with the mesh front. Wave me right through. I mean, I had paid two hundred fifty dollars yeah. for the exam, and and here in Nashville, and they didn't even ask for it. Um, but let me. Know, so. It sounds like you have the Italy part of Griffey's life sorted out. But here you are, going first to Nashville, Tennessee, and then to Kentucky, and then Saratoga, upstate New York, and having to find maybe uh, rabbit meat and rice and such oh, for him I here. Did. How do, how do you manage, be, uh, never mind yourself, which, you know, you have to feed yourself, and but your life is governed in a beautiful way by his needs, by Griffey's yeah. needs. Yeah. And, but also, frankly, when you're conducting, where does he go? He's been very good. I don't have to normally crate him that much. So he's very good in a hotel room by himself. Um, most theaters won't allow you to bring a dog even into your dressing room and, and rightfully so because many people are allergic um, to fur and stuff like that and they don't want the smells or what possible smells. So he's always been very good by himself and, you know, and I just make sure there's, you know, he's well fed and watered and he's been out on his walk before I go in for the show. 
and but it is means you you have to think about your schedule and right you know time your life and get everything right committed down in terms of the rabbit it's actually easier to find than you think and i recommend i've been telling various vets now when they ask about that um and i said well okay my my people you go to an asian chinese restaurant chinese supermarket mm -hmm. you can always find it there in uh, nashville it's kns international it's a it's a ginormous half hispanic half um chinese korean and they have everything under the sun and rabbit is 16 you can get a whole frozen rabbit for 16 dollars. that same rabbit will be about five to eight euros in italy in the supermarket so it's like buying a frozen chicken um, but you it, normally if you go to a non-ethnic butcher it'll cost you sometimes 40 to 50 dollars for a frozen rabbit mm -hmm. so go to the um I'm going to call it ethnic supermarket. You know, I hate that term, but you know what I mean. In in most of the cities, and you'll be able to find it for under twenty dollars, frozen and high quality. I simply just I boil it up in uh, just water, about three quarters up, uh, and then boil it for about an hour, and then let it cool, and then you just I rip all the meat off, chop it up into little cubes, and uh, shred it. Put it with the juice in the, in the broth into little freezer bags, and I can get about five bags out of one rabbit and about two to two and a half weeks worth of food out of one rabbit for him. And can you rice buy... from Asia substitute for rice from northern yes. Italy? Yeah. You can do um, medium or short grain white rice, which is good. Like Cal Rose rice or Nico Nico rice is really good. Um, I sometimes I will mix half. If I'm in a place where I can't get cheap arborio, I will do half arborio and half the cow rose rice and just mix it together. And um, it'll cook in about 20, 25 minutes. And, um, and, and is there a small portion. food for you? I mean, you grew up washed by many of the waters of the world, mm -hmm. starting with Asian cuisines and then Pacific Northwest food. Is there food that speaks to your soul that you want to eat or reproduce when you're in Kentucky or Saratoga Springs or even Italy from your life experience? The Asian food. And it's hard to, and I'm super picky about it. And I hardly ever go out for Chinese food. Um, I'm very picky about my, I grew up on great ramen in Tokyo. And if you know, um, sushi, sashimi, you know, um, great Thai. So, a lot of times I'll just cook it myself. In Korean now, I've, I used to think Korean was impossible. And now I've, I've, I've been learning a lot about how to cook Korean on my own. And so I've actually got a, a huge giant um, a care, uh, like a, my own traveling in this car because I had the car for six months. So I have a giant um, plastic bin that's full of all the stuff. So I have all of the, I live traveling with, um, Korean gochujang, gochugaru, this is the chili paste, chili powder, um, sesame oil. Um, I've got all the seaweeds, kelp, dried mushrooms. I've got my Chinese Sichuan, uh, the jan, you know, the, the bean fermented bean mm -hmm. paste. I've got the sweet brown bean paste. Um, I've got all of this stuff. I've got great, great Japanese organic miso, you know, just to make a simple miso soup. Um, I just travel with and soy sauce, you know, I, and I, do all of that on my own and also you know it's a way also I survive mentally on the road because I, I just can't eat out all the time I, I just don't feel yeah. right and I feel lazy and I don't feel normal you know the hardest thing for all of us on the road is uh, finding a sense of normality so I always make myself do my own laundry um, I will do all of my grocery shop when I get to a new city the first thing I do I land I figure out where the nearest Costco Whole Foods uh, Kroger's, Publix, whatever is, um, and then go grocery shopping, fill up the refrigerator in the hotel room. I always want a hotel room with the kitchen, not just a little, I don't mind if it's two burner stove. I travel with my own chef's knife and cutting board. Um, <laughs> I have even a skillet on this one and a saucepan, two sizes of saucepans because I had the room to do it. Um, and I just... You, you try to make your life as normal as possible. And so I was very proud this, I was in Nashville for the uh, Rigoletto and Las Wrangled back to back. So that was 50 to 60 days. I think I ate out three times the whole time. And hot chicken. Hot chicken, at least barbecue, yep. ribs and ramen. <laughs> Cause there's a otaku ramen, really great ramen. <laughs> 
Um, but you know, you can, it, it just gives you that sense of norm normalcy on the road. And, um, and, and, and I like to do things for myself and, and not just sit around in my hotel room and, you know, and, and just eat out all the, it, it's the worst thing you can possibly do. And you, you just get you can lazy. watch your weight and your health because you're you very can. slim. Yeah. Um, in because frankly, before I became a little more rigorous for myself, when I'd be on the road and traveling and eating and I would enjoy local foods around the world, mm -hmm. it wound up not being good for my health that I had to yeah. take serious measures to scale myself back in every sense. And mm -hmm. I have, and my blood values are good, but it is a risk if you're eating foods that are rich in salt and fat that inevitably wind up in restaurant meals. Yeah, because they, um, they, want, they have to, I hate the term, you know, but you know, the food network term, bump up the flavor, you know, that kind of thing. They have to no, bump I don't it up. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they do salt and fat and yeah. sugar, salt, fat, sugar, yeah. and it, it will make everything taste better, you know. And, I mean, and, and a quick sidebar here, you know, one of my big gripes about, for example, with, an Ital with Italian cuisine, when you get over to Italy and you start to re experience the regional cuisines of Italy, you realize how simple it is and how virtuosically simple the food is. So few ingredients, top quality ingredients, and such an incredible flavor. And it, the Italians respect, I used to laugh at the rules, the eating rules mm -hmm. and the food rules and the cooking rules. You know, it's like, why do you do it this way? Why do you make the pasta that? Well, because we always have done it that way. Well, what's the science behind it? Who cares? This is the way we always, but it works. And if you respect yeah. the rules and you know the traditions and you know the eating patterns and you know in this region, they like this and they prefer this, but you can go one region over and it may change a little bit. That's the, that's the variety, the fantastic thing. But Italian food and around the rest of the world, they, they throw everything in the kitchen sink in, yeah. you know, a pasta sauce with, you know, half a head of garlic, you know, and all this other stuff. Broccoli, it, which doesn't you know, belong there. Yeah. To and, make it and healthy. So, yeah. Just to make it healthy. So it's, it's so, it's so bravely simple and respectful mm -hmm. of the food and Chinese food is the same, you know, it's very, it can be. it's a yeah, lot simpler, stuff, yeah. but even, even the Sichuan, there, there's a reason for why they do things in a certain way and why they create layers of flavor in a certain way. Um, you know, and I mean, remember my mom even saying my grandmother in Shanghai, she said, you know, she never put chopped garlic in. She always did the Italian thing. You put the crushed garlic in the oil lightly and you take it out before it gets too brown. So you don't want that yeah. bitter brown flavor. And that's, that's enough garlic that flavors it. You don't put, you know, chop up three, four cloves, you know, but other cuisines, for example, Korean, there is a lot more use of the chopped garlic. So if you just understand how each of those works, but don't try to do this universal, you know, max flavored, you know, bold flavored everything because it's not how it is and I think your, your taste buds get kind of turned off to subtleties and food and and wine the same thing with wine you know the, the, the big bold international style like you know which like, often frankly in your state of Washington is among the highest alcoholic wines I've ever encountered because it's popular but <laughs> it's, it's not I don't like those wines either you know I've learned I had to learn to, initially it's like oh this is exciting and then after my it's like mm, it's you know i would drink I some remember European being wines. Eastern washington and having a wine that was 18 percent alcohol it was just Ooh, no, no, no 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 so two more questions because and then i have to go um question number one is your approach to food and this concept of subtlety and respecting old knowledge is that how you approach music yeah, yeah. I tell you, in preparation to this Rheingold, now I've known Rheingold since 1991. I played the ring, I was music staff in Seattle, I played the ring twice, the, 90, the 91 cycle and the 95 cycle. And, and then I kind and I've coached, you know, bits of Rheingold over the years. And so when I, when I started this, I actually started last summer in Italy, and I did one month on entire, like scene two alone, just on my little Yamaha Clavinova I found on Facebook Marketplace Italy for the house there. And I would just do one month, like all of July on that. Um, and then part of my study is I, I really insist on knowing what my predecessors did and how they dealt with the score. Um, and so I, I studied every single live Rheingold recording, never studio. You know, it's, it's, for example, this is gonna be somewhat blasphemous. Um, in Rheingold, you are either a fan of the Schulte studio or the Karyan studio, put those two together, or 
like the, the Boulez 1980 live Bayreuth. And they're polar opposites. And if you like the Schulte, you're gonna think the Boulez is cold and sterile. And, and if you like the Boulez, you're gonna think the Schulte is overblown and too dramatic. And there are issues for all of that, with covered pit, uncovered pit, we don't have to go into it today. But I, so I studied all of those and I was taught that by great friends of mine early on who were part of that whole, the, the parterre and, and the Mr. Tape network, you know, the collectors of, uh, of the old pirated recordings going back to like, you know, 1911 or whatever. And I remember one of my great friends and he, I was so happy because he was able to come see the final dress and the opening night of Rheingold. Um, a retired tenor and um, Paul Gudas, wonderful, wonderful man, lives in Seattle and um, started in Zurich and was in Chicago and San Francisco courses and, and wonderful character tenor spate use. When I started conducting, he said, Dean, you need to study the live recording. So I remember like when I did my first fall staff, he gave me like four or five live recordings off, taken off radio. And it was fantastic. And I could then study and see, he said, you need to see what a conductor speaking that language does with the score, what a cast speaking that language and preferably an orchestra speaking that language because they're responding to the text, to the libretto. Mm -hmm. And then why in performance, a certain singer may breathe in a certain place or take a certain tempo or why they may do a rubato a certain way, why a certain tradition of hanging, hanging onto a note works on the studio, but doesn't work live because you can't breathe without splicing it. And so he said, you will learn the roadmap, you know, listen to eight different traviatas live and see what all of those conductors and singers before you, how they worked it out. And then try not to reinvent the wheel. You know, you can go back to Comescrito and say, well, Verdi didn't sing this, didn't write this high note because I'm not going to do it. But you need to know the traditions, if you, even if you chose not to allow your singers to do it. And that's, that's the school that I come from. And so for this, you know, I, I spent a whole year and I made a whole document for the uh, Nashville Orchestra players. And they had asked, I said, these are, the, or, these are the recordings. They're all on YouTube now. They're all uploaded, thank God. And you can listen to them for free. You know, even the, the, the two Furt Bangler, 1951 Milano, La Scala, and then 1953 RAI, Rome, you know. So and listen to the differences. Listen to how the Milan plays it differently than the Rome group, you know, and just two years apart and, yeah. and how his, you know, it's, it's so fascinating and it will, it informs you. It's not that you're going to copy in the end, you have to then forget all of that and do find it, the music in yourself, but you have to know what the people before you did. You can't just say, I'm going to look at the music because I always tell singers and orchestra players, the music is like Google maps. It's only giving you 50% of the info. you got to get in the car and drive that car. you got to drive that music. And so you have to find what the music means to you. And that quarter note on the page can be a full quarter, a half quarter, it can be a mm -hmm. long quarter, a sticky quarter, a short quarter, you know, and you have to know style. You have to know tempo and Mozart's time. You have to know, we now have metronome markings for Don Giovanni when Mozart did it and how, how fast it was. Uh, we have approximate metronome markings that Verdi even approved now and for a lot of the, you know, do we do them? Maybe not in a 3,000 seat house versus a 1,000 seat opera theater. It's all acoustics, but you have to have that respect and knowledge base for the music, just like you do with food. You know, I can't just say, I'm going to go in and make this new fabulous pasta dish and call it, you know, pasta aladin, and everybody's going to love it. If I don't know what the long tradition of pasta sauce is regionally and what I'm doing, I can't just throw five things together in the pan and call it a great pasta dish because it has nothing to do with tradition without respecting the technique that maybe will give it better flavor. Just like the same thing, technique of the style of the music, you know? So two more quick questions. Have you conducted or pursued conducting in Italy? Not yet. We'll see. You know, I'm always open. I'm always open. Because I think I have, you I, Italian and you have a feeling for the no, Italian style. I, I really respect the Italian players and I love the way they play. And I can, I jokingly say, I can now tell an Italian pianist by just the sound and the instrument. I can tell an Italian violinist by the sound. There's, there's, a, there's a joy, there's a sunniness. There's a, the, the Germans mm -hmm. talk about affect, the emotional. There's, and and, and it's, it's related to the language. Final question, pasta, Chinese or Italian? Ooh. <laughs> well, we've actually talked about this a little bit uh, because we're more, well, I would say it's still in the middle, but I, I like the, the Southern eggless pastas. Like I like the eggless Chinese pastas, noodles. I don't mean which you prefer. I mean, who invented it? Oh, 
I, Sam and I would fight with my mom about that and say Marco Polo stole it from China. <laughs> so Italy. who knows? I don't know. I really Ancient don't Rome. Know. Ancient, Ancient Rome. They created gnocchi and they created something called lagana, which became sheets yeah. of pasta, which became yeah. lasagna. The Chinese may have cut noodles first, noodle dough first, mm -hmm. um, but even the Romans did that. So mm -hmm. I say Italy with my hat tip, my chapeau to China for doing a lot of good work, even <laughs> though they came later. <laughs> <laughs> they were very good at copying Italy. <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't want to step into the waters on that one because <laughs> I have a foot in both. both I know that. <laughs> Dean Williamson, thank you so much for this conversation and for all you've taught us. And you, I look forward to actually meeting with you somewhere in one of our cities and eating with you and cooking with you. Uh, I want to tell listeners that next week's guest will be the wonderful American baritone Andrew Garland, who is a specialist in recital and song, though he's a great opera singer. He's also a wonderful professor and teacher. I don't know if you've yes. ever worked with him, but he's a yes, wonderful, yes, yes. outstanding we, we other, yeah. artist. So just I beautiful. Look, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to talk about food. I doubt it. Not the way we did today, but he's really good at what he does. Yes. So he is. my best to you, my best to Griffey, wherever he is in that room. And Thank you. greetings to your husband, Sam in Italy. I'm sure he's watching. Go to bed now, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> And one day we'll meet in life. We will. we will. Thank you for everything. Thank Take you care. so much, Fred. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.